she's a mountain then you're in a hi everybody this is Lori and I am the founder and CEO of inclusivity and we're a company devoted to justice and sustainable fashion and this is our podcast inclusive talks and we are really excited today to actually have four guests uh, one a co-host and three women who are involved in the making of the documentary Stories I don't I didn't know is the name of the documentary. And our first guest for this sec segment is Rita, who was a um, part of the documentary, one of the participants in the documentary. Our co-host is Shannon Crossbear. And Shannon, thank you so much for being here. And I just wanted to say that one of the reasons we have Shannon here is we're making an effort on our podcast to, when we're interviewing people from different cultural backgrounds than mine, I'm making an effort to find a co-host who has a more similar uh, background, just out of respect for the guests and also because I think representation is really important. So that's why Shannon is here today. So Shannon, I'm going to turn it over to you. And just even as we were talking about... Um, just even the name of the movie that's coming up, right? Stories that um, you don't know, you haven't heard. And uh, this is an opportunity to hear those stories too, right? And so um, I'm Ojibwe and Irish. I live on the shores of Lake Superior, which are my homelands. I'm a member of Fort William First Nation, which actually sits in Ontario. But I am on the Minnesota side of the nation and have been here for the majority of my life. And um, so I'm very glad to be part of this conversation. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing more, Ramona, about kind of how you got here. How did you come to the room? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, ha mi tapi yepi. Hello, my relatives. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, it's awesome to uh, meet you, Shannon, and to be a part of this. Um, I am uh, Dakota, and my people are, I live right here in the River Valley where my people have lived for over 10,000 years. These are the Minnesota Makoche um, homelands of the Dakota here in the Mississippi River Valley. And um, so our people were exiled here from here in 1862. And I've come home, you know, I was called back here to become a voice and to make sure those stories that I didn't know um, are told and told from an authentic voice because really our stories have been told um, by others for too long. So I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm so happy to. I the first thing I thought of, and uh, for our audience, um, they may not know, but um, I, I'm Ojibwe and you're Dakota, and um, we have a little bit of history <laughs> in our uh, tribal relations from um, with this this area, right? So, um, I mean, the way that I was told was that by the time that we got here, um, there were Dakotas here in this upper region of northeastern Minnesota. Um, but there were some conversations about who was going to uh, be in these lands and and how those stories come by, right? And how, um, because of the wild rice and because of our prophecies, we ended up here. So I'm so glad to get to meet you, Ramona, and um, as a and, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation. So tell me, I mean, I kind of, I did get a chance to kind of see that you do some art and you, um, in addition to this project. Um, so tell me a little bit about that journey for you. Uh, so, yes, um, I, my, my dad was born and raised on the Santee Reservation where uh, we're all enrolled. Um, he came to Minnesota at uh, the age of 12 during the relocation in the 50s. And so he lived here a pretty good portion of his uh, life, was the 12th Indian to graduate from University of Minnesota. But when he finally left the Navy and left college, he, his job, he got a job in Florida with 
Honeylock, Space and Strategic Systems. So that kind of led me to be, you know, I grew up in Florida, pretty much. I was born in California, grew up in Florida. But I was really, um, always have been connected to Minnesota. So when I was 30, I moved back here. My whole family is still in Florida. And I am the only one here of my, like, immediate family. And now I have a nephew across the street, too. So um, I do, I... Um, I got married to an Ojibwe, stately in Red Lake, and uh, I have two beautiful children, and I s stayed home and did a lot of art. We owned an art, an art um, native art store in the Minneapolis American Indian Center, so I did, um, I stayed home and raised my kids and did a lot of artwork really to get by, but in the meantime, I learned so much about like who I was as a person by learning really old traditional art with hand to hand hides and um, understanding like just making a moccasin, the beginning at the toe and that beginning being a prayer and every one of those stitches being a prayer. And, um, and learning my language, there were only two places in 1995 where you could actually learn Dakota it was uh, University of Nebraska, so that was pretty much a big no. And then the University of Minnesota. So I moved here, learned that, and uh, eventually became uh, the director of Indian education for the Osseo School District. And I spent 15 years there and really look, seeing the failure of our students. You know, uh, really it seemed like no matter what we tried, what avenues, Minnesota was failing either 49th or 50 of all states. So the worst of all states for 50 years in a row. And so I saw that K-12 education was a big perpetrator in that. And so now I'm on leave and I am the project director for We Are Still Here in Minnesota. And this is a project that is composed of four groups, uh, four task force governance and policy, uh, K-12 education, pop culture media, and um, philanthropy. Can't leave that one out. Uh, but those four groups together, Native-led, working to solve problems and change narratives across our state. So we're using our social capital, our networking skills, the expertise of our Indigenous peoples. And so, um, and, and you know, this stories I didn't know is a classic example of changing the narrative and finding someone that has the courage to uh, stand and tell their story. You know, that's what we're looking for. So I'm so proud to be a part of this project for sure. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. I, I noticed the stately name. I was like, Oh yes. Uh, uh, my family has been uh keeper of a drum and has been a lot of powwows and of course you know you get to recognize our names in Indian country in Minnesota right so um so I'm wondering you know Ramona when you think about the ones that are coming after us um is there anything and they're you know pursuing both the story and the creative their own creative nature um is there anything that you would say you would like to say to them? Absolutely. In fact, my whole life is dedicated to those generations, uh, those seven. And, and when I say seven, I mean my parents, my grandparents, um, my great grandparents, myself, my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. Um, what we have lost has only been 140 years and we have, you know, now up to 14,000 years of Dakota presence in this valley. Um, and we are so, it is so easy to grasp and pull back uh, if we can revitalize language, if we can um, help our children understand our stories in all the ways. So that means understanding our science, technology, and star, star knowledge 
the way Western science teaches it, but also the way we see it as Dakota people, the way Ojibwe people see it as Ojibwe, the Mayan, you know, and, and understanding that knowledge is really focused on place, not about a group of people who think they can create knowledge, right? It's so diverse and beautiful in all the different places that it shows up. So uh, I would say know, know where you come from. Understand what that sense of place is because the creator will ground your foot there, your being there, your soul there. And after that, you know, you're not intimidated by other people. You don't feel like you're not worthy. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like um, being grounded in understanding your sense of place, where you come from, why you're there, who was there before you, uh, what is, uh, what are the values of the people I come from? Really important things. And, you know, America's whitewashed. There's really not, except our indigenous people and Rita here, who, who can say, who are my people, right? Who, who can answer that question? It's important. I think I, that was great, Ramona. I think um, for me too, is encouraging us all to find those places, right? And to really know that and that sense of place as you, as you were talking about. So, and, and you really got to be on this journey with Rita, right? And so, um, Lori, did you have a thoughts that you wanted to share? Well, you know, the only thing that I'd like to ask um, Ramona is if you, if you can kind of, in a nutshell, tell us about um, sort of your personal philosophy and what kind of drives you. I, I would love to know a little bit more about that just from you, whether it drives you to, to your creation or drives you to help um, with education, whatever it drives you to do. But what is that for you? What are those cores? I would say um, family, relationships. Um, establishing relationships to uh, not just people, but also the land and um, understanding why and what those relationships are. And so I'll use one for an example, which I think is so obvious, but maybe you don't think of it every day. And that is that when I breathe out that plant or that tree, that white pine outside breathes in mm -hmm. and so there's a reciprocity there that is so important. And if we don't understand our relationship to that earth and people say, oh, they're tree huggers. Well, yeah, you know what? You should be because there is a relationship there. So um, I would say my philosophies are about building deep and sustainable relationships, healthy ones um, with people, with um with nature, understanding that it's not, we're not linear, we're not just here on this earth, on our mother, but we are connected to the stars and there's teachings that come from that. Um, and I think my most important philosophy of life is just loving and raising good humans, you know, that care and, and take care of all those relations. Beautiful. I am a I am a tree hugger. I I believe that there's so much spirit and just vibrance. And if I feel sad, I go touch a tree, and I just I feel it breathing. Like I I believe that um, fully. So I appreciate you saying that very much. Um, I wanted Shannon. I wondered there was something we talked about before the podcast, just about the whole idea of asking questions in interviews. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so, well, uh, self disclosure. Um, I was raised where, in terms of in our tribal community, um, my grandmothers would chastise me for asking questions. And it wasn't so much the questions, it was kind of the, it, what happened as a result of asking those questions that really activated trauma. Um, and trauma because there were so many that asked questions of us and then delivered the wrong information, right? So anthropologists, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
And then, and then it was the asking questions always seemed to be come from a place of asking questions where it was intrusive and asking questions was a considered, um, something that was beyond rude. It was, it, it was an assault in some ways. And so I, and I, I, and I think part of that, I mean, I can remember even for myself, you know, people coming to my door, you know, and especially when my kids were small that I didn't know. And they would, you know, that was all. And if they asked questions, I made sure that those questions stayed right at that door. <laughs> but, you know, and because there was, there had been abuses in the past, right? And I still suffered from those uh, possibilities. And, and so, so when I was asked to <clears throat> come on and, you know, and, and be a co-host, and there were a set of questions, I was like, well, I don't know about that question business. <laughs> I mean, I'm okay with having a conversation, right? And <clears throat> the other thing that I learned about questions is if I asked a question of my granny, she would never answer it if I asked her a direct question. She would not at the time. But it might be three days later over a cup of tea, and all of a sudden, she'd start talking about the subject that I asked about three days earlier. So what she taught me was really to be observant and to be ready and to be open to whenever and however the information came. And I think it was a good, um, hopefully it was a good lesson. Um, I still ask a lot of questions because I also believe in this little statement that was from the Clue Train Manifesto. And it says, the questions we ask determine the future. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure that if I'm asking questions, that I'm asking good questions. I love that. And I want to say that that's very traditional to not answer a question, not answer it directly, and certainly not to answer it right away. Um, because that would mean that you did not give that question any consideration. You didn't pray about it. You didn't think about it and turn it over and think about all the different parts of that question. And that's one of the, one of the things we see in K-12 education, you know, Oh, that, that kid never answers a question, you know, well, you know, that's, that's something that comes really naturally to us because it's been modeled to us. So there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes on about questions. Um, I think for me in this arena, it's that I trust Rita and we do have a relationship and I trust this inclusivity, inclusivity because uh, I did, she sent me some info and I did, you know, look around because we are native people and our story has been told for us and you know what, if the answer to the question isn't what people want to hear, they'll make up their story and they can. So, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. It's, it's talk Ramona, and forgive, forgive me for asking questions. <laughs> but well, yeah, 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 it's, I think that's, and that's the other thing, like I, Ramona, that, I think is so important and why it speaks, Lori, to the importance of having someone who comes from that same background is because you get that, you're sensitive to that. That's what you've grown up with or you've been taught or you know, you've been ingrained and and um it's just yeah, it's it there's there is that. So there was for me, there's an immediate level of like a big sigh because Ramona comes in and I know she knows, right? I, you know, so there's a lot that happens that we don't have to spend the time educating each other that we know, right? Yeah. So, um, so I'm grateful for that, to the sensitivity that you have to that too. And at the same time, uh, the challenge we have from going from a place of invisibility to a place of visibility. Yeah. 
Well, and I think that that is absolutely what we are called to do at this moment is to have this cultural sensitivity and to, to uh, that would never have occurred to me. And so it is up to me to educate myself and find these things out and to invite people into my sphere who can tell me um, and who can teach me by just doing. So Shannon, for you to, you taught me that just by not being afraid to tell me, just so you know, this is a, this is a little bit of a strange situation for me and here's why. So I appreciate that very much. And I think um, as a white woman, it is a hundred percent my responsibility to take this on and to change this and, and to, what a world we will have if we can expand it so that we, everyone's perspective is valued and revered. Mm. That's, that's the future I want. That's the future I am working for. So having said that, I want to introduce Rita. And Rita, thank you for being here. And thank you for just joining us and just sitting. <laughs> great. It's great. I, appreciate I have to say so hi to Shannon. You probably don't remember me, but we, we, I spent a lot of time at Hovland and over 20 years, we're no longer up there, but we had a little cabin in the woods on Highway 69 and I met, spent many meetings, community meetings, uh, running into you and uh, saw your um, wagon in the woods, your gypsy wagon. Oh my gosh. So how wonderful very, is that? Very good to see you. I recognize you, Rita. <laughs> So this is Rita Davern, and Rita, could you do me a favor and just tell us a little bit about um, the film? Because what I'd like to do is talk about the intersection between you and, and Ramona and the film and, and just you working together, but I'd like a little background for people who are listening. What specific do you want? I think specifically, what's the story of the, the film? Like if you had to give a brief synopsis of the film, um, and, and why you started it. So how to get started and what's, what was the film? And it doesn't have to be totally brief. It's okay to right. take a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, growing up the way I did, um, there was the, uh, the, the way of life in this Protestant Gentile culture is, um, that I grew up in is um, separation. And I just, it just, didn't much work for me. And so I kept looking for ways to jiggle that and find alternatives. And life just led me in these ways. And I learned a lot from my um, adopted Korean son about connection because he wouldn't put up with sleeping in his own bed ever. <laughs> you know, I learned things. I, we finally decided he might know something here we need to learn. So anyway, so I just you know, have had wonderful people and opportunities and chances to get pushed in places that weren't comfortable, but that really made a difference. So part of that was um, being pushed toward my Irish roots. And once I got started on that, it was, you know, took a big, became a big focus in my life. And so I did start going back to the community my grandma left in 1887. And I started, you know, just spending time there with the farm families and I'd go from kitchen to kitchen and mm -hmm. drink more cups of tea in a week than I could count. And um, over decades, I started getting close enough to them that I started actually hearing what really happened there, you know. And um, so when I just sat, my niece actually came to me and I, in 2015 and said, Rita, you've been on this search. You are the only person on the planet who has all the pieces to this 1200 year family story. You have to do something with it. So it doesn't get lost again. She said, why don't we make a documentary film and I'll help you. Well, she thought it was going to take three months. <laughs> no. So I started on this and the people, my, my people in Ireland were so just said, whatever you want, Rita, this is what we'll do. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you need. We're there. And they've so helped me, so been with me. And the new film that's coming out this month, uh, Burn Girl, is that story. It's the Ireland part of my story. So it's been the best that, you know, my son died in 2010. And um, there's a lot of grieving. And by 2015, my mind wanted something else to focus on. and. Um, 
so I went back to this um, connecting to my roots uh, subject, and it's taken me where we're at today, and it's been a wild and wonderful and hard and good adventure. <laughs> so out of that, how did you get to stories I didn't know? That's, that's all about yeah. Melody Gilbert. So in two years ago, I got a grant from the ocean. We, we'd been working on the film. My friend Kevin and I was a filmmaker. Every Wednesday we'd come and after work and spend two hours on the film for four years. And we'd go to Ireland and we'd record interviews. And, and then we had 20 minutes to show at that point. And I um, got a grant from O'Shaughnessy. And then I was able to, I knew I needed somebody who knew what they were doing. So I hired Melody Gilbert. I'd been in her classes. We knew each other. And I knew she's the best there is in terms of documentary films. So I brought her on. But little did I know. I thought I was making a film about my Irish grand, dead Irish grandma. And she said, first thing, nope, Rita, this film is about you. You're going to go on a journey. We're going to follow you. And we'll find out what is behind this strong passion you have about your family history. What's sitting there behind this? Mm -hmm. And so she's the one who pushed me every step of the way. Yes, you can face this. Yes, you can find it. Go down this path. Yes, you can do this. I never would have without her, mm -hmm. without her push. You know, so she's she'll be on here later, but she's really a powerhouse and she will face anything. Yeah. You know, she's not afraid to face or challenge anything. And that's what I needed. Yeah. So what's the core of the movie? What's the, the core story of the movie that um, Ramona was a part of? Stories I didn't know of the court. Can I sit on this question for a couple days? <laughs> um, I think it's about how possible, what you get when you dare to face the past, the hard parts, the good parts, dare to face what was hidden, what was forgotten, what was lost, and what was lied about, what you were lied about. And the challenge and the opportunity of facing that, I think, is what the film's about. That's so, really interesting. So how did Ramona, how did you and Ramona connect for this film? <laughs> I, I, I went on two or three Badote tours. I just couldn't get enough of it. And I knew that Ramona, um, she's a healer. And I knew that if I was going to trust my white self, um, you know, with a Native person to, you know, uncover something um, that maybe she would be, I could see that working. And, um, and bless your heart that you um, said yes when I came and said, could we interview you? That's all I, that's all I thought we were up to was an interview. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> but and Ramona what was that like for you well um for me I could tell that Rita really had a spark you know I know that when I started researching family history it moved me it moved me beyond I can't even describe how it moved me mm -hmm. and I could see that in Rita that she had already done a lot of work. She knew what she wanted. She knew um, she had spent enough time learning some foundational Dakota history to know um, what she was, you know, what what she was doing, what she needed. And I did really think it would just be an interview, <laughs> but you know, that's kind of how um, things go. Is that. Uh, we, we really did bond. She came, she met my niece and my son and my family and we had tea and we, she brought lovely, what was it? Irish soda bread. Yeah. And you know, um, so there's a, there's a lot more to the story. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even know that we've ever even said, maybe this is like the first time we've ever really said it publicly, but my mom was born and raised in England. She's a little Brit. She talks like this. 
she's just little tiny. Um, but she actually is full blood Irish and she was born in the war or after the war. And she was born when her husband was away and brought to a, a orphanage in England. So um, I think that's the other part of that is that, you know, I'm half Irish and I haven't been able to ever really explore that, mm -hmm. but there are hints, hints that I cut my, my spirit knew that. So, yeah. So this story just connected with me and we've stuck together thick as thieves since then. <laughs> We were going to actually bring my mom here for the premiere and COVID hit. So, oh, well. Okay. So, Rita, from, you know, looking at your Irish heritage, how did you get to addressing the Dakota, the land? How did you get to that point? Um, because you could not have. It, you know, right. somebody could write this story yeah. without ever addressing that. So how yes. did you do that? Well, I was in an organization that included a number of Anishinaabe people, and um, I got schooled by them um, over years about um, what I didn't know and what I had been lied about. And so I was, um, I hadn't gotten to the point where I realized my own family was, you know, there was a story there, but I did want to know more. And then I ended up, there was, um, God, what's it called? Um, free university course on mm -hmm. Dakota history. And it was taught by Waziata Wins, um, daughter, um, Autumn, Autumn. Yes. And in that course were me and 40, people under the age of 25 who were mostly radical anarchists. <laughs> they didn't claim anything. They didn't claim their family. They didn't claim their anything. They were completely against claiming anything. And so I stuck with them and I would go home just so I was so scared the whole time, but I stuck with them for two years. Every week we oh. met and we, learned we learned Dakota history together and then I challenged them they challenged me on a lot of stuff um and gender and you know being able to, oh my gosh it was it was rich and I challenged them on claiming I said you cannot be an ally to anyone else unless you claim your own self and they started going to their grandparents and asking them questions and they would come to me and one of them said you know what? My girlfriend's ancestor was related to Michael Collins, and you've got to tell us about the IRA. <laughs> so it was really rich and wonderful. And then I ended up teaching another section of that later um, with some others, and it was really good. But it was hard, 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 really hard, like really, really hard. But I just stuck with it, and I knew that if I faced that story, I could face anything. So then, when you approached Ramona, um, what did you what and thought it was just going to be the one-off interview? Um, what what were you asking? What were the questions that you were looking for her to to help you with? I think it was something like, um, I know that my ancestors settled on. Dakota land here in St. Paul and I'm investigating that and trying to learn and really understand that story and I know that your people were also part of that story um, and I would love to hear about that I think that was basically it mm -hmm. am I right Ramona yeah but there um, <clears throat> so we do some some storytelling on the land and the land has an energy that it becomes the teacher. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about those birthing waters uh, at the Bedote and um, birthing islands where my great-great-grandmother gave birth to my dad's grandpa at Pike Island, which is uh, Weetatonka, the island that Rita's grandpa owned, mm -hmm. you know, and so she... Rita came to 
several times on that um, walking tour to learn that story. So she had done her homework, but I think you had gathered a whole lot of information too about place before you asked me, right, Rita? Mm -hmm. So Rita, how did this collaboration and this movie, what, what shifted for you? And I know it's a whole host of things, but, but what, what changed at the end of the movie or in the midst of the movie? Well, it, a story is fine, but once you know the person whose story it is, it goes deep, it goes deep. And you want, you just want, you want the best for the people that you love. And so um, it has a lot of meaning that I now know people um, who were there in the Dakota community in the 1860s. So to me, that's the big. Did you, um, I remember from the interview we did when we watched the movie together and from the movie that um, you have made kind of a, a decision about your land and going forward. Is that, is that accurate? Um, well, I, I tried various things. I had to find where in my heart I could um, make this a really smart and honest um, putting something right. And so I finally figured out that the Indian Land Tenure Foundation is the organization that I wanted to back and support and let them be the decide the priorities and what they want to do with whatever resources I can give. And so it's going to be some kind of a trust um, that we're going to start working on in January. Um, that will go to them and they can, I don't even think I'm going to designate where it goes. I'll let them decide that. Mm -hmm. And Ramona, for you working with Rita on the film, what, what, what shifted for you? What, why does, why does this matter to you? Well, I think um, in all that I know about my own traditional cultural values and all that I feel like America doesn't know, uh, about their own because there was a thought about patriotism. There was a very uh, essential um, thought about Americans to create this new idea of values. So they didn't bring their language or culture, right? So we know America is, is, is really lacking in that area. Um, so what it brought for me was, um, even though I, I understand that and I see that, I see that even people will tell you I have no culture, I don't know these things, um, that I couldn't be who I was without understanding that part of me. So I can't imagine what it must be like to not know that part of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was an amazing opportunity for people who don't have the courage that Rita has to stand up and say, you know what, I'm not perfect. I don't know. You know, one of those things we don't say is I don't know. We really discourage that, right? Because that, that shows a sign of weakness. Um, so Rita's right out there. I don't know. And, I, and that story says, I don't know, I'm surprised you can walk with her in this experience, but also um, it, and I think it wasn't even on purpose, how it shows how that messes with your family, right? Like you might be on this journey, but that doesn't mean that everyone else is, right? And that was shown and, it, and her family survived that. It survived uh, not not agreeing about it, not knowing, not agreeing, uh, maybe even at some point saying, don't continue, <laughs> Read it, don't continue this. And you know what? I think it strengthened them. I think it helped them to uh, exercise um, conversation, exercise 
perspectives because If she's a mountain